Welcome everyone. We are at Ladies Freiburg. Um, I will start showing you a small presentation that I did about how we are going to work today. Um, can you all see my screen now? Yes, okay. So actually this is the last meetup of a series we have been doing. This is actually the part five. And the series was a toolbox series for women in academia, women in science. And after four uh, meetups where we have been talking about more technical skills like coding, R, reproducibility and other things, we decided, we, we thought that, I mean, being a woman in science is not only about having the right tools or knowledge, it's also like about the context that we want to include and we want to discuss to, with each other and to talk about. So we decided to like use this last meetup um, to, discuss, to discuss what is being a woman in science right now. And a small presentations about us. Um, we are our ladies Freiburg. We are in the south of Germany. You can also follow us on Twitter. Also our meetups are uh, all scheduled in the, on this link. Actually, next week we are having um, a meetup about, I think, a ggplot and like data visualization, which would be very interesting. We are organized by Divya, who has been the founder of Our Ladies, and she is now in Copenhagen, but she will still be there uh, organizing Our Ladies Freiburg. Me, I'm Elisa, uh, Kyla, and we have and Julia, who has uh, recently joined us. So welcome, Julia. <laughs> um, and also the panel, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy about the panel we have today um, because, I mean, I, I really think everyone, everyone that has joined as a panelist has like a very interesting background, but also I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we are kind of all around the world, I think we are, uh, it, we are kind of having people from all the continents. So I, yeah, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. I think it can be a really nice discussion. So actually uh, we, ha we have Daloa from, she's actually from Venezuela. She's living now in Germany. Um, Ivana, who is from Argentina. Uh, Camila from Algeria. Uh, Lily uh, from Georgia and Ma, uh, Manasi from uh, Our Ladies Mumbai. So I will, I mean, um, I decided not to present each one right now. It would be a bit long, so I might um, let each of the panelists to present themselves, but they all have great backgrounds and yeah, thank you for joining us in advance. So how this will work, um, so the panel we wish will be structured in this way. So this is the small introduction um, that I'm doing. Then we will have the presentation of the different panelists. Um, and also, I mean, the idea is that they present themselves and they also tell a little bit how they got interested in this in these topics. Then we will discuss which problems do women face. Um, when working in academia and in science. And the idea is that, is that um, the panelists make a small presentation or, or, or give some ideas. And then also everyone is welcome to make comments, ask questions, or even get into the, into the discussion. Um, so you can, you can either um, um, put questions or comments in the chat, we will ha be having a look on it, but you can also unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Um, then we will talk about like possible measures, solutions, and um, yeah, that could be taken or that uh, to maybe solve these problems or, or make uh, these problems uh, not uh, yeah, kind of to solve these problems or, or to attack these problems. Uh, it will have the same structure as before. Um, and then we will have some time at the end, I hope, for open questions and, and discussion. So, um, 
I don't, I, I think, I don't know how many, so we decided to invite everyone, women, men, and other gender minorities, so a kind of everyone. What we ask is that, I mean, we have had some situations before where men also take the initiative to talk to talk first. I mean, we want to welcome everyone, but on the other hand, there are already statistics that show that when, the, when it's a um, cis man that does like the first question or the first comment, then women usually have less interventions during the talk. So we ask men to, to wait until in each part until one woman or um, gender minority has first um, say something, give a comment or ask a question. I hope everyone understands this. Um, yeah, so this is on my side. I will now stop sharing. Um, so yeah, I also see, see that in the on the chat there are people from every, everywhere. That's also really nice. So now um, I want to yeah ask the panelists so to present themselves and yeah some short words on how they got interested on the topics. I don't know. Is there anyone that prefers to start, or shall I just um, say who wants like like say? Who wants to? <laughs> who should start? <laughs> okay, then I would just um, uh, invite Daloa to start. I mean, just because, um, yeah, her name start, starts with D, so it's the first. <laughs> so please, Daloa. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, well, first and foremost, thanks to Our Lady Freiburg for organizing this event and for the invitation. I feel very flattered to be here uh, with such great panelists. Uh, my name is Aloa. I come originally from Venezuela, and I am now currently living in Munich in Germany. Um, I am a medical doctor by training. I did medicine in Venezuela, and then I came here to live in Germany in 2014, uh, pursuing a master's degree in epidemiology, which I got from the um, University of Munich. And I am right now a PhD candidate and um, uh, assistant researcher at the Occupational Environmental um, Institute of the LMU, of uh, the University Hospital um, here at the university. And um, yeah, I work as an environmental and occupational um, epidemiologist, mostly. I am also the co-founder of Our Ladies Munich, which is sadly now an inactive group. Um, it doesn't really exist. We don't have an organizing team, but back in the day, I uh, was part of the co-founding group. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it so far. Sorry, I was muted. Second in my list is Ivana. So hi, Ivana. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, sorry for my English. Uh, it's very rusty because I usually speak in Spanish. I'm from Argentina. Uh, I live in Bariloche, uh, Patagonia. And uh, I am kind of an outsider here <laughs> because I'm not from an art community, but I am very close with the art communities in Argentina. We have a lot of them and they are really, really powerful. So I will tell them, I will tell you about them later. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a community called Data Genero and we work around gender data uh, or data. I don't know uh, which one. Um, and it's like a, a huge discussion, no? Data, data, don't worry. Uh, we, we want to attack the problem uh, of the missing gender data in our region. Uh, we want to collect data, we want governments to get involved and start collecting data, not any data, but data that, that will help women and LGBT community to solve their problems and to understand their problems. We have some questions that can't be answered because we don't have data. So that's what we are doing. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in education and now I'm doing a postgraduate diploma in data science and machine learning. Um, I, I work with that and I usually work from a social point of view in the data. Thank you, Ivana. I mean, 
no one has to feel bad for the English. We are all doing, an, or most of us are doing the effort of speaking in a language that is not our mother tongue. <laughs> and I mean, everyone would feel bad about the, the English, I guess. I mean, except for the ones that uh, have English as a native language. I mean, we all, I, I, I mean, I also feel I, I always bad about my English, but I decided to stop. Um, yeah, regretting about it. No, I only ask if somebody doesn't understand something I say, please ask me again and I will try to say it differently. Okay, but I think everyone understands you, so it's perfect. So third in my list is Camila, she from uh, Algiers, uh, Arles in Algeria. So hi Camila. <laughs> Hi, hi everyone. So, uh, I, do you listen to me? I'm so sorry because I'm um, I'm coming from work, uh, and I was <laughs> so I'm coming up from Algeria, and I'm an uh, economic uh, studies engineer in uh, Sunatrak. It's um, how to say it's um, a company of uh, oil in Algeria. It's the big one, of, I think. Uh, so I was um, teaching in the University of Bumerdes, and they have uh, also a master in uh, Aero and uh, I'm sorry for the sound. I have a master in uh, operational research and um, strategic management. So uh, I'm so happy to be in with you uh, today, and um, that's all. Let's, uh, <laughs> welcome everyone for us uh, with us. Sorry, my English is not really good, <laughs> but I hope that you can understand me. Yeah, thank you, Camila, and I won't repeat what I already said to Ivana, or and to everyone here to discuss. I mean, um, yeah, we don't have to speak perfect, and I think we understand each other. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you. So the next one on my list is Lily. <laughs> uh, she's also an Our Ladies from Tbilisi, Georgia. And I mean, I will apologize if I pronounce a, a, a name or a city not in the correct way, because on one side, I'm, I'm very happy that we are from all over the world. On the other side, I was before the meetup, like trying to hear on Google, how do you pronounce all these places <laughs> correctly? So yeah, my, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Elisa, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, it's a really um, interesting panel and and uh, series that that you have organized. So so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, I'm from um, Our Ladies Tbilisi, uh, which is uh, in Georgia. So uh, we have been active now for about um, five years, almost. Um, and uh, but I'm also uh, a PhD researcher uh, in demographic studies or population studies in, in Tallinn University, which is in a, another small country in Estonia. <laughs> so um, and and in demography, usually we look uh, very detailed at, at uh, data uh, and data quality and, and especially uh, gender data. So. Um, so I guess you could say that uh, demography is the original data science <laughs> uh, and, and which especially uh, places a lot of emphasis on, on gender uh, data. So especially if we talk about uh, gender data gaps, then, then this is also uh, very important in, in our field. Uh, looking at uh, mortality, fertility in different countries is a problem if you don't have uh, good quality data. So, uh, so that is... Um, one one connection of uh, mine to this topic um but yeah also through my different research topics i have been interested in um in in different um like female life paths female career paths um, either indirectly or directly so somehow i have also come come to this topic through my research work but, uh, but mostly, I guess, it's also through my own experiences and through colleagues' experiences and through hearing what other people speak and, and 
and through that I, I got more interested in this topic um, of, of women in science. <laughs> but yeah, thank you uh, for the invitation. Okay, thank you Lily. And then on my list is uh, Manasi uh, from Our Ladies Mumbai, India. <laughs> yeah, hi Elisa. Thank you again for inviting me. It's always nice to be back here. Um, uh, so Mansi, I did my bachelor's in economics, post which I went to study commerce, business, and then I also did another master's in statistics. Um, I worked for a couple of years in Nielsen. I worked in consulting and also data science there. So I had a really cool blend of the two. Uh, whenever I got bored of one, I could always jump to the other. Uh, so it was a nice space to be at. Um, I sort of, uh, post that, uh, I sort of wanted to get a little deeper in data science. I started a fellowship in artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, studied there. Uh, I now work as a research engineer at this really small startup, uh, which aims to sort of combine computer vision and deep learning and really enhance the whole e-commerce industry uh, in that regard. Uh, so yeah, that's me uh, till now. I think that what really draws me and really sort of gets me um, gets me interested in a topic like this is because I think when I studied economics, like 60% of the batch were women. And then I went to study tech and it was less than 10%. So I really sort of, uh, I think that that really, I, I sort of see the differences in, in the most minute ways play out. And I think that really uh, the question of why social sciences tend to have more women when tech don't uh, really irked me. And that's what really draws me to a topic like this. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, Man Mansi. Um, so I have kind of the first questions, first for the panelists. Um, so, I mean, I think Manasi has answered it a bit already, maybe Lily as well, but I wanted to know if there was like some point in your career, in your life, where you realized that was like, that these topics were important. Um, so, I, I mean, this, this, I mean, the, the, the feeling or the idea or the kind of conscious of, of these topics might come from like movements that, that are already there, might come from own experiences, uh, good experiences, bad experiences, actually community experiences. So I, I don't know, it, in my case, I think all the movements in South America and especially in Argentina have like a big, um, uh, kind of um, influence on me at some point because I also come from Argentina, uh, but I also want to hear like the, which were these these points in your life or these um, things that actually yeah made you more interested or also active because I think all of you are somehow active on gender topics because I, you are either an our ladies organizer or founded an Our Ladies chapter or founded um, uh, like gender observ data gender observatory. So I am, I, I want, I think I want to know a bit more about that. And I, I also have an idea on, yeah, on, on how all this started for you, which were those points that, that were like the, the, the beginning of the, your interests. Shall I, shall we, well, I will leave it for whoever wants to answer. Maybe can people start, can yeah. also raise hands um, so that we don't lose track. Yeah. Right. Um, for me, uh, it started uh, 10 years ago. I didn't tell it in my presentation, but I'm a teacher. I teach programming and coding to children and teenagers. Uh, but I started uh, teaching like popular education in some really uh, marginalized neighborhoods in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. And then I started to teach uh, like the basics of computer, computing uh, for uh, adults, female adults that were like computers are not for me. I don't understand anything about technology. And I started to realize at that point that uh, we grow up and 
everyone tell us that we should stay away from technology <laughs> because it's not for us. It's for men, super smart white men. So uh, that's when I started to realize that we had to do something about this. Uh, and I started to get involved in uh, more uh, specific technical uh, abilities to teach them. Uh, and that's when I started to see that there weren't so many women uh, in, this, in these fields, uh, and especially uh, doing like a science career, like most of you are, are doing right now. I decided to start uh, teaching and building communities, but I started to go to the path of doing a, a master PhD. Uh, it's on hold for now. But uh, I see that uh, it's really hard for us, uh, especially when we are going to uh, classes that are uh, on, uh, offline, we are uh, facing, facing each other. Men can be very cruel and classmates can be really uh, bad sometimes. And that's also part of, of our problems. Uh, so technology nowadays is uh, putting us on this path of growing, but we can't, as women and LGBT, LGBT community, decide where it's taking us. And we should be making the decisions and being on top of everything too. Uh, that's kind of. Thanks, Ivana. I see that, that, that Aloha is raising her hand. So in my case, um, it, it's a collection of different experiences in my life. Um, I think one of the earliest is uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago when I was still an undergraduate student doing science um, as a medicine student. Uh, some of my male colleagues who were also doing science were very easily seen by um, other friends, not necessarily in the field, as men of, men of science. And if I was uh, like doing the same as they were doing, belonging to the same scientific society, I was never seen as that. I was never called a woman of science. And I always wondered why, why, why would it be like that? And then the next uh, step in my life was uh, when I actually started uh, pursuing a career in academia here in Munich. Um, I saw that a lot of my classmates in the master program and in my workplaces as an intern were women. But uh, most of the people in higher positions in management were mostly men. I am lucky enough to have a woman as a supervisor and she's amazing, uh, but she's maybe two out of six or seven leaders, uh, group leaders in the institute where I am. So it is definitely interesting that there's a lot of uh, women scientists in lower positions, junior positions, and then I don't know what happens. Uh, there are a lot of uh, ideas of what's happening with women uh, later in life. So I became interested in that. And the third uh, uh, special moment in my life was uh, when I became more serious about R and found the Art Ladies Global Community. And we do have a, another R uh, group here, uh, like a mixed group. And it is true that when I went to the events, the majority were men. And I was like, but, but why? I mean, there's, a, there's many other women that I know that use R. Where, where, where are the women, you know? So then I discovered the Art Ladies Global Movement and it's like somehow, uh, probably because of systemic sexism, women have been neglected and either we self-select out or it is sometimes the behavior of men themselves and it, it, it's not like it has to be a conscious thing necessarily. I don't want to blame any man in here. It's a systemic thing. So it's within the society. And then science is a subset of society. So many of the same patriarchal schemes are repeated in this uh, very small uh, subset of, of, of our society. So I think those were the three most important things in my life that brought me into uh, the topic of women in science in general and, and to think about this problem and see how we could um, help solve it in any way. Thanks, Daloa. I mean, I see for, that on the chat, uh, Swat has answered something. I mean, she has said that she knows what happens to women, to women later in, in their career, uh, and that's children. And that takes us, I mean, already to the second point, which are, okay, which, which are the, the maybe the problems that women face 
in a concrete kind of in a yeah in a concrete point of view like which are all these problems i mean i think we have kind of mentioned some um of them already uh while you were talking of the systemic issues and yeah this um, as um, people say also that's like classroom and i also see lily raising her hand so please lily <laughs> want to comment something yeah, well, I was uh, yeah trying going to uh, I guess combine the the two topics that that you that were mentioned now. Um, I guess yeah, just a little bit about my own experience. Um, it was uh, just looking at at some point noticing that that uh, female scientists and male scientists are are having sort of different. Um, slightly different um, ways of doing their careers and slightly different ways of um, of uh, doing things which which were not maybe always uh, appreciated uh, similarly so 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 that was uh, sort of a concern point for me that that is it really like this all the time or is it possible to change it or is it possible to prevent it uh, and and it um, come coincided with uh, with uh, also the time when I saw the Our Ladies Global Movement. So so it was um, a good opportunity to uh, to combine these uh, different interests. Um, but but yeah, I think one of the one of the issues is uh, that uh, that family uh, careers or having a family is not really um, adjusted in, in academia as a systemic issue so so it's really uh, difficult to have a family usually or it's difficult to juggle both family and work life so so this is why all these different uh, family and work life balancing measures have been taken up and and different countries have different measures um, but academia has perhaps well it has a sort of a controversial thing on the one hand it's uh, it has this uh, reputation of having flexible working hours so so you know you can um, go to work maybe a bit later than than an average office worker um, and you can you know you can uh, come home at a different time but but at the same time it's expected that you really work hard all the time even if you're not uh, at work so so it's really a controversial issue uh, that how how do you combine these uh, different um, obligations and how how the academic people in academia and the systems uh, system uh, actually support your different choices or not so so it seems like there is more support needed uh, for for accommodating also the family choices in there. I see that Daloa uh, raised her hand. Yeah, um, thanks, Lily, for your intervention. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I think that one of the issues in academia is this, you know, yes, we have a, a, a flexible work hours, which would work well uh, with, a, with a woman who not only has to take care of work, but also a family uh, responsibilities or, or uh, any other type of unpaid work. Uh, but then there's this thing of publish or perish, right, in academia. So we have to be constantly uh, working and producing papers. And if you don't have publications and you don't get grants and you don't get uh, job promotions, and this is part of the, um, the contradictions that you're talking about. How, like, it, yeah, fine that I get to have flexible hours, uh, but then what happens if I need to take time off because I am in charge of uh, taking care of my parents uh, who are sick or whatever? Or what happens if I decide to have a family and, you know, part of the systemic issues in society is that the woman should take more care of the family and the children than the men, even in countries where both uh, parents in a heterosexual relationship are uh, uh, like are able to take uh, parental leave. Um, it's mostly the woman who takes the majority of the time because uh, whatever, I don't know, apparently women get to be more with their kids. I don't know if we are have more the right or more the responsibility, but that's the way that it is. And this is a sacrifice that women then have to do for the time they do research. So how do you, how do we reconcile this uh, 
push that academia has on us to keep on producing if we have to take longer periods of time off in comparison to men. Yeah, I mean, on this regard, there is also in the chat, um, Aide commented that in Brazil, female researchers represent uh, 53 of the total postgraduate scholarship holders um, at CAPES. This is one of the largest public funds. Um, probably you pronounce it in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, but they are minority on leadership uh, of research groups. And I think Ivana answered that that's similar in Argentina. And I, I also want to uh, add some, like also comment something about that. So usually, I mean, statistics show that um, like when a man is married, like a young, young man is married, so that means stability. Uh, and that's positive, like in a job for when, when he's looking for a job, but when a young woman is married, that's dangerous. It means, yeah. Uh, you could get a uh, long leave because of, of maternity. And now Divya is raising hands. I also just wanted to quickly pitch in with a study. Um, I don't remember where it's from, um, but there was this very nice graph that I remember at the conference that I saw it at where after um, a, a couple, a hetero couple has um, a child and if both partners took leave, like if they took maternal and paternal leave, um, the man's career um, actually accelerates after because he could take that leave to actually publish more and work better. But the woman's career deteriorates after because she has additional responsibilities. And so even parental leave, just taking parental leave, um, and I'm assuming the man also did his part, but uh, he didn't have to go through the physical effort of actually producing a baby. Um, and I don't know all the factors responsible here, but this graph was very pretty where you have like, oh, the birth of a child and then the career paths after. Um, just quickly wanted to put that in. Thanks, Divya. So, I mean, I first, I know Kyla, you're raising hands, but I also saw before on the chat, uh, Suat, she said like, how is something, if she could say something about being a scientist mother of four children. So I invite her to tell us about that. <laughs> No, I just wanted to quickly comment that um, it can be perceived that it is um, imposed on women to stay at home and look after their children. It can also be a choice. It can be, you know, it's empowering to be able to make the choice, a privilege, actually, because to stay home and look after your children, you have got to have enough income in the family. What I think could be done more by society is reintegrating those women who choose, who have the option, who have the advantage, the, um, the privilege of staying home is the reinsertion afterwards. It's finding a path back into research and academia because research does not wait for you. Six months out and that's it, you're out. So it's finding a way back in, which should be in my view, um, done as a political thing rather than leaving it to the person to find their way back. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Really interesting point of view also. So Kaila is next on the list. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to comment like everything that everybody said. I, al I always think of it as also like that top level careers have this patriarchal assumption that the the career person, whoever it is, has like a partner at home that's not doing anything else, but is just caring for the home. And like, that's also regardless, even if that's a relationship that doesn't include a, like a cis man, there's still a problem for this, for a career system, which assumes that, yeah, that the person who's working doesn't have to do any of the housework, any of the child rearing, anything other than work, wake up in the morning, like get handed some food and then go to their job. And so, I, yeah, I just think that it's like a very systemic problem that's based on really old and pervasive uh, ideas of what a family looks like and what what a, what a worker looks like. Okay, nice. Uh, thanks, Kyla. So now also Sarah Goodwin in the chat said that like inst institutional support is important and res um, responsibility to resume research should not be on the new parent's shoulder. I think related to what Swat said. 
And now I see Ivana raising her hand. And then yeah. uh, regarding what uh, Kyla was saying, uh, I think that the word uh, systemic came up a lot. I think uh, it's not about particular and individual issues. We, we are in a system uh, that allows this to happen. Uh, I just wanted to bring some numbers from a research uh, it, that it was made in Argentina uh, a few years ago, because we don't have new data about this, and this is an issue. But it came up that women were doing all of the housework and taking care of people. And it took like five hours of a day to cook, to wash, to clean, to take care of children. Uh, and men had some responsibilities, but they spent half of that time doing that, half of the time. So uh, that's enormous, five hours versus 2.5 hours in a day to take care of these of the things. And it all comes to women. If women don't do these uh, tasks, they are seen as bad mothers, uh, bad women. Uh, and that's something we have to attack at some point because uh, it impacts our professional careers as well. Yeah, and to continue on that topic, it's not only the, the, that this unpaid work takes time off doing paid work, but it's also that it takes time off our free time, the time that should be for us to relax and to prepare again for, for, a, for a new productive day. And when, these, when there is an imbalance, normally, I'm gonna talk about straight couples right now, when there is an, imbal an imbalance in gender, in who takes care of which responsibilities, uh, unpaid work responsibilities, then one of the partners gets to enjoy their free time more than the other, and therefore be more productive for their paid work than the other. So this is also part of the problem that we have, this imbalance in the unpaid work reflecting not only in the paid work time, but also in the leisure time. Yeah, so I see Camille is already raising hand, but before there is also a comment on the chat. Um, and the question is if someone has seen changes as a result of the pandemic um, related to workplaces and expectations. Um, Camila, if you and um, you can, yeah, please uh, also join the conversation, then we can answer this question. Hi, everyone. So uh, I think it's the same thing from uh, in Algeria. For the women, um, women should do anything in home and should do uh, all tasks of, tasks of home, should take care of her uh, husband, her uh, her. Um, her children and also if it's it isn't a married woman she had to to take care about her family her um, her brothers and the, also her sisters if she, she had the little sisters for me i think that um <clears throat> it's some so it's it's some hard work than a, a lot a little bit another work for them. But I think that uh, women are strong uh, enough to do something, to do all of this and to be um, successful in her career and to, to work and to, to do um, a, a little, um, to do many good things. So she can be a searcher or a, or a teacher in university and take care of her, um, her house. So um, what can I say that we had to, cha to change a little of the, the mentalities in our societies and explain that, okay, we can do it, but we need also help uh, from the others, from the, from the man. So I think everything is uh, about mentality and about um, what we learn from our society. So we have just learned that everyone has uh, her responsibilities and everyone has uh, his career. So we had to choose the, for example, for the man, for the, the woman, she has to choose the, the man who can understand what all of things she do. So who can help him and who can support him. And we have also for families, 
should support her her daughters because there is we know that there is um, many uh, ladies that don't work and don't study also from in Algeria or in Africa or in another because of um, the mentalities. So we have to introduce this culture of of uh, formation, of uh, learning, of uh, studying in um, in everywhere, uh, and we have to instruct uh, a culture of discussion, dis dis discussion in everything. So we can discuss anything, and we can find solution of anything, but we have to uh, talk about it. Thank you, Camila. I think we are on that now. <laughs> Um, and then I saw Lily um, raising her hand. Yeah, uh, there are now many, many ideas I want to follow up here. Uh, uh, but um, so, so yeah, if we if we think uh, specifically about the academic sphere and and uh, what's specific for women in academic sphere, then then indeed one of the issues is how. Uh, you, well, not only in academic sphere in that sense, but how you get back to the workforce. So once one issue is how you get to the workforce. So, so indeed that is what Camilla mentioned that, uh, that um, the ideas of what is suitable for a woman to do and, and uh, like what are her social roles um, besides caring for family members. Um, so, so that is uh, sort of the first step that that um, women also see, and not only women, but people surrounding them also see that uh, that it's really enriching if, if women are doing different roles in their lives and in in the society. Uh, so, of course, that that's where uh, not only women uh, themselves uh, are. Um, the driving force uh, behind changing these uh, these ideas and, and, and attitudes, but also the the rest of the society uh, is is very important in contributing to this. But then, when we turn to the um, to the later uh, steps, then uh, once uh, once uh, yeah, indeed, because I think that's that's what's important to understand that there are um, different. Um, life stages in, in your life. You cannot always be um, sort of uh, the productive uh, uh, worker as you were at age 25, for example, or, you know, your, the way you work, your knowledge, everything changes. And, and that's connected to also your other social roles, your family roles. So, so indeed what Swat mentioned, um, I think that's also very important to create opportunities uh, to come back to work. And, and one of the problems with academia is that uh, it has been really competitive in, in probably most of the countries. Um, so, and, and that is related to lack of funding from the government to research and, and academia in general. So you have really competitive uh, research proposal systems grant proposal systems. And I think there was last year um, a good example uh, by the Dutch Ministry of Education and Science who uh, actually uh, took a political statement that we have to make academia less um, stressful, uh, that we want to academics uh, to also have weekends. Um, so I think that's that's a good initiative and it's interesting to see what uh, what kind of solutions they, they come up with. Uh, but but it's the first sort of a political statement that I've seen uh, who has actually said that, um, that, that we need to address the, the competitiveness of, of academia. Thank you, Lily. Um, yeah, now I, I think we are, we are on different topics. We had some, some topics that were listed. One was uh, actually family care and work. And I think we were discussing a lot about that. We were also like, at the beginning, we were talking about positions and occupations when we were talking about like difference between the amount of women on lower positions and, and um, on higher positions. I, and we touched like, systemic issues. And I think we are now also going on to like these attitudes and non-visible non barriers that actually we also, we kind of discussed something when, for example, um, Ivana was saying no, uh, that she heard from different women saying no, that computing is not for me, the computer is something I don't, I don't understand. Um, now, um, so I like that we are also um, 
touching all these all these points. And I think um, uh, also Mansi wanted to say something, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I um, I just can't. I mean, the raise hand button was there in the start, and now I don't know where it's gone. Technology is weird sometimes. Uh, but but yeah, I actually did want to speak about uh, what Elisa just mentioned, fortunately, about um, uh, about the second topic. Um, so I think that one thing that's really I see this pretty widespread is that there is uh, uh, I think that women uh, look for relatability at all levels. Um, so, and I mean, not just women, everybody does, everybody likes to sort of look up to role models and, and look at it either way. Uh, they like to pick protégés who sort of reflect them. Uh, I've seen a lot of men go like, look at other sort of men in their team and go like, you know, I was like you, or, you know, um, this was me at 25. And so they sort of really help them um, come, you help them with their career path. And I see this, um, and I see this, um, I mean, even like people look up to role models who they're like, okay, this is, this was me. Um, and I see this uh, reflect a lot um, in, in levels of leadership, uh, even like when hiring, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of men sort of be like, okay, this candidate uh, is just has the career path like I had. Uh, or, you know, this candidate sort of studied the same thing just like I did. Uh, and because there are fewer women in um, that you see in leadership, uh, what happens is that this kind of gets accumulated. Um, that, you know, men tend to hire men and then tend to hire men because of this relatability factor. Uh, so I think that uh, one, I think immediate um, immediate second generation bias, as they call it, is this. And to really, I mean, I'd love to hear on how we can sort of, um, you know, how we can correct for this, because I think this could really change things. Thank you, Mansi. I also want to say that on the chat, there is like a parallel, very interesting discussion going on about like the implications of COVID um, on, on careers and I mean, I would, it's already kind of a longer discussion with also some interesting links that Ivana shared. So I also um, invite you to have a look at it. Um, yeah. Um, Sorry, I usually have a lot of links in my toolbox uh, that for, from articles I read and, and stuff I, I come up with in the internet. So, Whenever I see something like, oh, you should read this, and I have it uh, on the other screen. So sorry if I put a lot of links, but uh, it's what I do. <laughs> well, Very welcome. <laughs> you don't have to read all the links right away. I see Kyle, I just posted another one. Um, we can, when we send you the link to the recording, we can send you a link of everything in the chat. Plus, if panelists have anything to add, just send it to us. We will compile everything nicely and um, send it to you. So don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> Uh, regarding what uh, Divya put on the chat about uh, hiring women, uh, I was going to say that there was a, an old study like from 2014, I think, that showed that women applied less for shopping. Yeah, uh, because we are, if we are not 100% sure we are, we are fit for the job, we don't apply and that's a, a fact. Uh, some companies or maybe positions put a lot of requirements and, and if we don't met all of them, uh, we, not, we don't apply for that. Uh, so they are trying to reverse that, putting maybe less uh, topics, but we should also be more like men sometimes and apply even if we don't know 100% because it's not about the technologies we know, it's how we can uh, learn them and the basis we have to understand new technologies. So that's one uh, uh, thing regarding that. Ah, Kyla put that on the chat, sorry. <laughs> and now I also see Daloa raising her hand. <laughs> yeah, to, to follow that, that idea, um, um, it, is, it is interesting also what, I, what I've seen in my field is that uh, for, groups where there is a woman as a leader, 
also the, the 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 people forming part of the group are majority women um like in our group is exactly like that there's just a few men and it's not exactly in the same proportion as in other groups where you would expect more uh, women than men in junior positions and then shifted i think there's also a thing about role models so women I, as a woman, really like following another scientist woman as a role model. Um, and I don't know if men might want to sometimes self-select out uh, from having a woman as a leader and prefer also a man as a leader. I mean, I just don't know if there's like an inherent um, thing that we have to follow or that, that we feel more inclined to follow our own uh, a, a leader in our own gender. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I have also seen uh, this. Uh, I have this observation in my own regular life, and wanted to bring to bring that up and see if that's a similar experience with uh, others here, and if you have any ideas of what could be happening or how could we deal with that. So I saw first Livia and then Lily, <laughs> and third Ivana. <laughs> We are not hearing you, Vivian. Sorry. Um, just wanted to add to what um, Taloa was saying with, um, and I think all the Our Ladies co-organizers here and Ivana can collaborate this of how women have trouble even seeing themselves as role models. Um, and so even if there are women in higher positions, are they going to see themselves as role models and say, oh, here's another woman who is a junior and I'm going to, um, yeah mentor her in a sense or is that something we have to pull up um even to find speakers for our ladies we have to really pull on people and be like no you can do it come speak for us um and that's into like that's intrinsic in women seeing or not seeing themselves as role models and then my second point was that um I've attended panels where they've invited women role models who I do not want to follow. Like I've been to women in science panelists where people said, no, you cannot have it all. Um, you should have a child when you are in your PhD and then focus on your career and not be with your family because your career is important and just very bad advice like that and not the kind of discussion that we are having right now. And um, that is also intrinsic of how they see themselves as role models. They, they've gone through a certain struggle and they think that advising us to go through the same struggle is the way, but um, what we are talking about here is systemic change, not how to best struggle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Livia, next one. Uh, Lily, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I, I, I also think that um, that role models are important. I think also for me, like choosing uh, a scientific career uh, was was always one option because of my other female family members <laughs> who were scientists. So so I could see like even though it has always been difficult and I have seen it, uh, then then it has also been sort of a an option still. Um, but I I was just I was going to chip in with um, like coming from Estonia and Georgia, uh, which uh, both have some some um, joint uh, historical background at some point. Um, so from from a setting where uh, women had very high female labor, uh, so labor, labor force participation rates were very high among women. Um, but that was um, coming uh, together with also high expectations uh, for the family. So although women were really employed, uh, they were also um, uh, supposed to be the main caretakers at home. So, so that meant that the burden uh, was really heavy on women. Uh, and, and, but that kind of mentality um, is still there among the older generations. So indeed, like Divya mentioned, um, there are probably some generational differences in, in what um, all, some women have experienced and then expect that, uh, you know, you should also uh, do it this way, that uh, you will be fine if you, if you are going to work uh, very hard on all, all fronts. Um, but I think that among our generation or maybe, well, generation, not in terms of age group, but just in general, it's, it's indeed like there's sort of a wish to move away from that kind of thinking, um, maybe, at least it seems to me. <laughs> 
Thanks, Lily. And now I see Ivana raising her hand. Yeah, uh, just two things uh, about what uh, Divya was saying. Um, maybe when there are women in, in, in a group, uh, leading a group, or it's not uh, necessary a condition for women to be safe and uh, accompanied. Uh, sometimes we need more than just being women <laughs> to, to have a feminist uh, uh, point of view or gender perspective in, in the workspaces. So that's for me, it's really important that people uh, go to gender uh, communities and start to discuss these issues uh, because we, we can't be sexist too uh, as women. And another thing I wanted to, to say is that uh, we are always talking about women and uh, from data gender or from organization, we always try to put also the, the fight for trans and non-binary people in science and in data, uh, because uh, if we have a lot of issues and struggles, they have more. Uh, because it's really hard for them to, to access a, a good job, to make a, an academic career. And uh, it's important to mention uh, trans and non-binary uh, people too, like Elisa was saying at the beginning. Uh, we don't have much data about that and we are trying to start to gather the data. In Argentina, we had like a survey in 2012 and only 200 people were surveyed and that's all we have. And it's a lot, uh, it, it, it's like, it's not enough. Thank you for your comment, Ivan. I think, yeah, I mean, even I, sh I should be saying women and gender minorities uh, to try to um, name everyone. Yeah, so thank you. And then now I also see Daloa raising her hand. <laughs> Yeah, um, I I think one of the issues. Well, I'm gonna start with the with the idea that women are in general half of the population, right? Roughly, we're 50 50 percent talking in a in very binary terms, um, and yet we talk about uh, women in science being minor a minority. Uh, I don't know if we're a minority. I don't have the numbers right now. I don't think we are. So I think we are either in the same proportion as in the general population or even in a higher proportion. Right now. Um, and the second thing is that I, I, I mean, academia is, I think it's no surprise to anybody that academia is a, is a system that has been created to the image of a Western white cis straight man. So I think what's happening is that if you don't if you don't go into any of these categories, you're automatically a minority. So if you're not a man, if you're a woman, then you are considered a minority. If you're not straight, if you uh, have any other type of sexual orientation, you are considered a minority. If you are not cis, then you are also considered a minority. And if you're not from the Western society, you might also be considered a minority in science. And it's like, how many papers do we have from the Asian countries, for example? And I know because I come from Latin America, it's hard to do research in Latin America, but there's a lot of work being done there. So I, I think we are all part of a minority because of the way that academia has been traditionally led. And I think it's time that we just crash that paradigm. It's not true that this is the representation of academia, uh, this, this idea of being Western, straight, white, cis men. So I think it's very important what we're doing right here, showing that there's a lot of women doing great work and interested in this topic and also men. I'm, I'm really happy uh, for any cis men that are here interested in these discussions as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, I think we could do a whole other discussion on differences in, for example, regions in the world about, in academia, like also where the publications come from and that's, yeah, also very interesting and also like that we are maybe in numbers not a minority but we are just considered a minority it's also very interesting so i think i saw kyla now yeah. yeah i just um wanted to touch on that where uh, deloa says that we should be changing this because i feel like often it's the case that we think that the seniors or that, that these pressures are coming exclusively from the top down and it's coming from supervisors it's coming from tenured profs, it's coming from organizational people. 
um, when very often it's also coming from the bottom up. So I think it's often coming from your coworkers, your fellow PhD students, even or students even even more junior than that, that we kind of buy into and propagate this um, productivity culture and this kind of a culture that says that academia should be all encompassing and I work every weekend and I didn't stop working last night until midnight. And I think often we don't realize how much we're playing just buying into the story that they're that they're telling us and also trying to share it with all of our friends and I so I like the perspective or like the perspective that a lot of this change can come from the bottom up it, you don't have to wait until you're like a tenured prof and try and change the whole system but um just by yeah not buying into the structures that you don't believe in and that you don't support that we can make change in that way as well from the bottom Thanks, Kyla. And actually, I think building communities, communities is a great way to start. Yeah. So uh, I see Mansi raising her hand. And after Mansi, I want to really invite everyone to make comments or ask questions. Um, yeah. So please, Mansi. Yeah, I think another point that I'd like to make is that um, one thing I've noticed is that uh, while most organizations now uh, want to want to make change. They want to. They recognize that they want to make this a more equal workplace. And I know they don't. Um, they sort of at least claim that you know they're doing their best. Um, something that I've noticed is that there are some um, there are some um, minor uh, biases in the way they even communicate. I remember when the pandemic first hit, and I remember the workplace I was working at at the point was like, I remember we got an email and it said that, you know, um, the employee should prioritize his family first. And I was like, wait, but what about me? Like, am I to prioritize my family first too? Uh, and I think that I realized that in these small nuances, I'm sure the author of that email didn't mean ill uh, for women there, but I think that we all ought to be more aware and uh, to be extra aware and as as employees and or as anybody who witnesses to call it out i think that uh, it's important that you know some i mean that person i'm sure didn't mean ill but just recognizing this actively calling it out these small small things i really think would go a really long way thank you mansi so I really want to invite, um, yeah, people in the audience to participate, make comments, ask questions. I, I guess that many have a lot to say. So I see Carmen. Hi, sorry, I can uh, cannot put my camera on, but can you hear me? All right. Okay. Now, I just wanted to go on. There's a many interesting points. Thank you very much for organizing this. And I just wanted to come in. Uh, I don't remember who said it uh, now. I think Kyla, maybe. Uh, but it, it's about basically the, the change from the bottom. Yes. Uh, but it also should not be boiled down to the individual, right? So like the word systemic has been put out there and the reward system matters a lot, right? So if we, like there's different levels and we have, we have to be very aware of what systems of reward we can actually tackle. And as postdocs, for example, we can tackle the system of reward for PhDs having in mind that they still need to prevail uh, given the rules of the system, right? And then making sure that we push towards people that have more power to change the system of reward, right? Uh, so yes, I mean, we we have to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that people don't work on weekends, but at the same time, we want people that don't work on weekends and that have a similar gender perspective, class perspective, whatever, to get to the top so that they have a higher power when it comes to changing reward systems. So it's a difficult trade-off sometimes. And, and I think it's very important to be aware at what position you are and what is the system of reward that you can change and, and then communicate with the others, right? Um, but yeah, so I cannot assume that I'm gonna have the same power of one person that has a permanent position, right? Um, I also don't wanna trip over and not make it uh, to replace, because also we're allowing people that don't care about this to be on the top, right? Yeah, just wanted to mention, because it's, it's a bit tricky. It's not that that is agree, huh? It's just that 
me as an intermediate position as a postdoc that doesn't have a permanent position but has a lot of responsibilities of mentoring uh, PhD students, I find myself there in between. <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. I mean, I, I also agree that, I mean, building communities and not going into this system, so not playing the game of the system somehow, I mean, it's very important. And on the other side, the change does not come from in the individual. It will come from many people. So, yeah, that's also a good point. A good point. Um, so, is there anyone else that wants to make questions? Do some comments, um, or shall we go to the next point? I saw, yeah, Divya. <laughs> um, I can just get the ball rolling, maybe, for questions. Um, and my question is like a combined question for Mansi and Ivana, because uh, Mansi raised the point for um, immediate second generation bias. Is that correct? Yeah. And I know that some companies, at least like some bigger companies, have started offering um, training sessions against uh, implicit biases. And I was wondering if Ivana knows of studies or has worked in the field or has data on this of if, like, do these programs work and how well do they work? Do we actually, if you, if organizations and academia start doing um, implicit bias trainings, is this? even a solution or is this something that they can just stick off their paper and be like, ah, oh, our, our employees have an implicit bias training, but it actually doesn't solve much. So thanks yeah. for your question, which also takes us to the next point, which is like, which are the possible yeah. solutions or measures we can take? Yeah. I don't know if the term bias washing exists, but <laughs> it should. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you read it somewhere. Can you please tell me? Uh, but I think that a lot of organizations are building like the ethics committee inside of them, like Google. We know what happened with Timit Gebru uh, recently. Uh, if you don't Google Timit Google <laughs> Timit Gebru, and you will see that uh, she was fired from the ethics. Uh, she was the team lead in the ethics in Google. So uh, I think that. We, uh, sorry, I, I spaced out a little, but that it shouldn't come from within. We have to build a, 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 like algorithmic uh, surveillance and ethics committees outside these a huge uh, organizations and uh, start to audit their uh, algorithms and their methods and their data too, because all the data uh, is skewed and uh, biased nowadays, uh, many of the data. Uh, uh, because it's built from men or from teams that don't have this uh, perspective and maybe it's all data and the data talks about uh, our society and our society is uh, biased too. So for me, I think that we need to build something that is outside and it's not only one, but it should be like a collective with a lot of people doing that. Because if it comes from one organism that is going to surveillance and uh, keep an eye on all the ethic issues and bias issues, it's not going to work in my opinion. Yeah, I, I feel very similarly. I think that, uh, I, I think that just calling it out, um, making, people aware is really important because like I said, I think that most people, most people who do it right now don't intentionally do it. I don't think they intentionally go like, you know, because she's a woman, I'm not going to hire her. Uh, I don't think they do that. I think that it is, it is, um, it is a bias that they have in their head and just making them aware by algorithms or by someone telling them, okay, look, you're doing this and you made this decision because of this really um, sparks that light bulb. Uh, so I think that just awareness is, is really the first step. Yeah, thanks both of you. So I also have a comment about that, which is like a recent experience. So I was on the like, um, I don't know, like on the committee kind of gender equality committee on my, on my work. And then many of the comments was that, okay, but 
now, at least here in Germany, this is not happening anymore. And I was completely surprised about that comment. I mean, here, for example, in parental leave, there are there is the possibility that women and men take together 14 months, and usually men take two months and women take 12. I, I think it's about the 80% of the cases because other, otherwise these two months get lost. So either the mother or the father can take only 12 months and then the other can take only two. So I was completely surprised about this kind of going backwards. I mean, we are now conscious of these issues and now we think we don't have these issues anymore. Um, and I don't know, I was really shocked. I don't know if someone had a similar experience or like even women saying this is this is not happening here anymore. Yeah, so I, I see. Sorry, I see Carmen raising her hand. <laughs> In the, no, uh, it's just I want to clarify. So you're saying that in the German system, the uh, one person takes two months and the other the 12th? So the, actually the system is there are 12 months to split between yeah. two parents. If the two parents take at least two months, so these 12 months become 14. Okay, yeah, that's what what so, so, what I had understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry, I, I thought you 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 meant you, you meant that if you take fourteen, only one person takes two and the other twelve. Okay, no, no. Yes. I, no, no, I no, understand. no. I mean, yeah. there are twelve months yeah, yeah. to split, and if the and if both take some months, the, so they can they get like the the couple gets more two more. Okay. Okay, I understand. What, I, what I was saying is that the statistics show. I mean, that at least. I think in almost 80, I don't have the numbers, but in almost 80% of the cases, women take more than half of the time. And I think in a very high, but really high also percent of the cases, women take the 12 months and men only the two that they yeah. lose. Yeah. yeah. And even though that, that happens, I see people saying, yeah, I mean, this is not a big problem for us right now. Like men get involved in care in care activities, and, and I think it's that they, they do get involved, but it's not still fifty and fifty percent, right? Um, and I see Lily. I know Carmen. Do you want to say something else? Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually I raised my hand for something else, but I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> no, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> Sorry, Please. but uh, Lily can go first, and I can go after that. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to say about that, that um, so, so yeah, these different care policies in, in, in different European countries, but mostly I think the Scandinavian countries have been at the forefront who have had this, um, I don't know, gender neutral um, care leaves, parental leaves, or, or like where fathers are also taking up more and more time. But even I think there are, are some research is coming up and showing that, uh, that of course, um, women are still doing most of the job, as was also the case with the COVID. Uh, I think most of the research that has come out of, of this COVID uh, has shown that, that women had to stay more at home and take care of the family more still. Uh, so there are, might be that there are different things going on. Like from the one hand, if people say that, uh, that they think that there are no more problems anymore, maybe it's um, sort of a thing about how they see the problems they, they think that these traditional problems they we have solved them so so these are not problems any, anymore for us um, or on the other hand they sort of internalize these um, um, beliefs that uh, that uh, yeah what's what's appropriate to do so and and that they or that it's uh, their own decision making or something so i don't know i i got a bit carried away <laughs> but there are uh, many 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 things there thanks and also only to say because it's just related to what you said that in canada or what i said also that in canada it's the same so parental leave can be split it but um the majority is taken also uh, by mothers carmen now you your you, your turn <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. Just I feel a bit bad because it was a follow-up from before, and it's not connected to this. So this looks like the it's more of a comment than a question type of intervention, which I don't like. Uh, <laughs> but uh, now, just because the other day I was attending this OSF uh, workshop, and they mentioned uh, this uh, book called uh, "Feminism, Labor, and, Di and Digital Media: The Digital the Digital Housewife." 
And I started reading it and I found basically like, it's a lot of what we're doing is doing a lot of extra free work um, that it's basically conceived in the same way as the free work that has maintained society for a long time within the, uh, the, within the house, right? So I think this idea of being very aware that we don't want to end up solving everyone's issues but putting our free time and making it invisible, it's uh, very, like, it's very needed. Um, and I just wanted to recommend uh, the book. I have not read it all, so I don't know if it goes crazy later, but I <laughs> the idea of making sure that we're creating all these communities, all this uh, data, and that we're working so much to change this, let's not make it into like this hidden, um, yeah, issue as, <laughs> as domestic labor, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Carmen. So there, there is a request on the chat, if you could uh, post the book. Uh, title on the chat, I think. Um, sure, I'll do now. Yeah, thanks. And then there is also an interesting comment from Lily that she says that also the discussion of traditional family ideals going underground but not really disappear, that that's also another discussion that I also find interesting. Um, yeah, and also Ide is talking about um, yeah uh, solo mothers uh, who don't have anyone to share the, their work with. Um, so the option of having children alone, uh, a father who disappears, parents who die, and so forth. And now Carmen, thanks for the post. And I see Ivana raising hands. Yeah, yeah maybe this is a cathartic rant from my part. <laughs> But uh, I love communities. I love building communities with women and LGBT community. For me, it's uh, crucial. But sometimes I wonder if they are keeping us busy while they are making all the great decisions about everything <laughs> here. So um, for me, it's really important that we come up with some actions and uh, we don't just end up uh, work, uh, uh, talking about what, we, what our issues are. Uh, and for uh, the, it came up with uh, something that Carmen uh, said about this book. We know everything we are doing. We should uh, try to get to more people, to more women, to more LGBT communities, to more countries that are uh, far worse than ours. Uh, I think it, maybe in Argentina and Latin America, uh, things are really bad, but sometimes it's it's worse somewhere else, <laughs> and uh, it's 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 good if we try to uh, get to those places and get to the places that are making decisions for the lives of, of people. Because if not, we are just standing here. And I see a lot of men that are posting all the things they do everywhere, and maybe we don't, and we are like, oh no, but I did all of this this last year, but I didn't post it anywhere. I didn't put it, and I didn't share it. And I think that it's not the going to solve anything, of course, but it, it should be uh, present and visible. Thanks. I think that's a nice point about like possible solutions uh, also related to the problems about attitudes and systemic issues. So very important. <laughs> Um, so the idea was like I, I think we went we went kind of um, smoothly moving from the first part. We was actually presenting the problems to the second part, which is talking about the um, possible solutions um, of these problems. Um, I think Lily also agrees. I'm, I'm not looking at the chat. Oh, Lily also agrees that making uh, your any work visible is also important and getting paid for it. And I think Ivana is kind of choking, getting paid for what? And um, yeah. Um, so I don't know if, if someone wants to comment a bit more about like which points you see important to like change things to, yeah move to the solutions and um, I see the Loa raising hand. Yeah, so from what we've been discussing, I've been making some notes and um, I agree um, here with Manasi that one of the first steps should be awareness. And I think we have discussed several um, ways that we can create awareness. Uh, that includes the part of uh, building the communities, creating a safe environment for discussion. Um, 
and, and doing this bottom top type of work. Uh, but also as Ivana just said, it can also just stay in there as a sterile discussion and it doesn't lead us to anything. So I think it is important that um, after we do this discussion, we, we, we make it clearer and clearer what is it exactly that we need and that we do these demands to the higher powers, to the people in higher positions. So, so as to see if there's some change that would be valuable for us uh, as women in science. Um, otherwise it could also end up in, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the mental health awareness solutions, which is like, oh yeah, let's just do like this mental health awareness seminar and then that's okay. And everybody's still, you know, suffering from mental health issues in academia and it's like, well, that doesn't really solve anything. So it is a question of whether the um, people in higher positions are, are really, they know what the really issue is and what we really need, even if we know it already. I liked uh, in the beginning that, um, uh, who was it, Suad? Suad mentioned this thing about uh, reinserting women after taking this time off. And then the question is, how do we do that? I think we need institutional support to do that. But the question is, what is it exactly that we need? Is it like more time to compensate for the time that we were off? Um, is it, um, uh, I don't know, special rewards in terms of uh, payment, um, like some sort of a handicap uh, type of, of, of proposal? I, have, I really have no idea. This is part of why I need here the community to brainstorm on this. So I, I would, I saw Divya and Swat, but I would add Swat. Maybe she wants to answer directly to what Aloha said. We cannot hear you. I don't know why. You are not muted, but we cannot hear you. Maybe choosing on the um, video setting uh, or microphone setting. If you want, you can try and then we go back to you. Hello. Ah, there we hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? But I can't hear you anyway. <laughs> Maybe you've changed both of the speaker and uh, the uh, the audio. Cool. Yeah, there we go. Um, my headphones back on once I've finished saying what I'm saying. I can just give the example of my boss who is who has got three kids of his own. Uh, I applied for a um, how do you say that in in English? Practicum. That's like being. Um, a trainee, which was aimed at students. He didn't have to give it to me, but that was a way for me to reinsert myself. So some kind of a scheme to retrain yourself. So the main trainee positions right now are aimed at master students, master degree students, or you know, bachelor, undergraduate or postgraduates. What about us who also need to retrain after a while, maybe some kind of a, a scheme? Does that make sense? Yeah, so you, you, you mean something like creating? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you mean something like creating specific protocols and schematic uh, rules to how to reinsert um, uh, women, in, especially women after a time off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like this idea because I think one of the issues is also that people don't know what to do exactly. There are no protocols, there are no schemes, no rules, no nothing. So it's like, how do you even start? So I think this is part of our job after discussing, of course, all of our experiences and the data that we have, which as Ivana clearly said, is not enough. We need more sex disaggregated data and also uh, for other minorities in science to understand really the extent of the issue. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I see Kyla and Mansi. I also saw Divya raising hands, or am I wrong? Um, um, I did, but I lowered it because it was the same as what South said. But um, I do have a comment on that, but I'm going to wait and see if Kyla and Mansi have the same comments. Okay, then I think I saw Kyla first. I was just going to offer one example of something that I that the University of Freiburg is doing. So they have a bridging scholarship 
that when you complete one academic degree, so say you finish your PhD, it will bridge the time for you to write an expose to do your next academic step. So if you're writing, um, you need to write like an expose to get into a postdoc position or something. And that's aimed exclusively, I, I, they have it aimed at female researchers, but mm, yeah, can't have everything. Um, so they, they aim it at women that only they can get this bridging scholarship. And I think that's a way to try, it's, it's aimed at retaining women in academia at the steps where it's easiest to get out of academia. So like in between, in between positions. Just as an example of something that the University of Freiburg is doing for that. So Mansi, <laughs> yeah, I actually just wanted to echo the point of sort of creating um, schematic rules. Um, one thing is that I, I also think that this should kind of be applied to various contexts. Uh, one example I can think of is that I remember about five years ago when I just joined my workplace and I was shadowing my boss while taking an interview. And I remember um, there was a female candidate that was uh, on the other end. And I remember he asked her if she plans to get married soon. And I was pretty perplexed at the question. And I remember coming out of the interview and I asked him, I was like, you know, why did you ask that question? How does it matter? if um, she's going to get married soon or not. Um, and I remember him telling me, saying that, you know, uh, she's of the same religious community as I am. And, and I know how the community functions that, you know, if a woman gets married, I know that the first couple of years is just going to be, you know, run in the, in, she's just going to be busy in the household. I know how the community functions and I wouldn't want uh, and I wouldn't want a team member like that because if she's just going to get married in the next two three years it's just going to you know the family is just going to force her to um, to like sort of um, be be in the house or you know just be more involved in household duties which brings me back to a solution I remember at that point I was like hey, I, I remember just you know being okay I just remember accepting it uh, now that I think about it I think that you should not I mean I think that creating rules uh, creating specific areas where you can't, where you shouldn't ask people in an interview. These questions shouldn't be allowed uh, to be, you know, really asked to candidates in an interview. I think that HR um, or, you know, even, or anyone, you know, being uh, made, being aware that, you know, there is a strict evaluation criteria. These are the buckets that you evaluate candidates on and not sort of come up with your own external bucket. So don't come up with, uh, something completely unrelated to this, because then it's not fair. Thanks. I saw at the same time Daloa and Ivana, so I leave you. So Ivana says Daloa, so I think that, no, yes. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to extend that same idea, Manasi, to um, uh, submitting grants in academia. Um, as far as I understand, when the reviewer committee um, go through all the grant applications, blinded to the sex of the applicants, it is more likely that teams that are um, leader, uh, like, yeah, leadered by, by women or that contain um, an, an, an important amount of women in the team get awarded the grant. But when reviewers uh, get to see the sex, it seems like men tend to get it more. I think this comes also from this implicit bias that we all suffer from men and women in society. Um, so I, I would agree that sometimes it's important not to include these questions that could um, change uh, decisions significantly based on our implicit biases. However, the long-term solution, not anywhere soon, I think would be that we, we, we are just so aware of this implicit bias that, that even if we ask these questions, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but I don't know how long it might take until we solve this issue, how many generations might take until this. So in the meantime, I think this is a good solution. Yeah, I only want to add that on the chat, there is also discussion about these this questions being illegal in interviews in Europe, not, not in Brazil, but I think they are still asked in interviews and it's very hard then to go and, and make and say, I, I was asked this and do something about that. Even when women feel really frustrated about that after an interview uh, or gender minorities. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment that on that, that the discussion that is going on the chat. And now I see Ivana and Tyler. 
Uh, one other thing that it's also long term, but uh, and it's kind of cliche, but I think we should mention it. It's education for young uh, kids from all genders, not only men and uh, women. Uh, because if we show them that there are role models uh, that are diverse and that can do anything, uh, it's going to be really, really different than the education we got when we were kids that was kind of old fashioned maybe, or not as uh, open and free as we can give them. So that's just one uh, step that we can uh, actively make. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of communities here in Argentina that are doing it. There is a Women in Bioinformatics Network that is working for a lot of these things in, in schools. And uh, there is a, a community called uh, Científicas de Acá. It's like scientific women from here, from Argentina. And they made this children book telling all the stories of science, scientific women uh, here. And they don't have to be dead <laughs> to be in a book and to be uh, recognized. So uh, that's two things I'm going to put in the chat so you can uh, maybe uh, replicate them or do something with it. So first of all, I just wanted to add and say, I think India also has at least one project that I know of where um, women scientists were included in a book with um, illustrations and um, yeah, and there are a few projects going on in India on that front as well. Um, and another thing I wanted to add was with, um, uh, now I forgot, I think South, South said that. Um, with the internship. So that's what I heard a few years ago as well. And at that point, I just thought it was crazy that companies were offering a six month internship to come back, irrespective of how long your maternity period was. So imagine you have, uh, and especially if academia starts doing this, it's just more unpaid labor for academia. You have a three to four year PhD, which where you're underpaid, then you start a postdoc. Then if you I have to take a break after your first postdoc or something and they reintegrate a six month internship or even if companies start doing that it's just like you go back to a lower pay grade and six months is a long time i've just started a new job and my onboarding period is six weeks not months and six weeks is still really long assuming i mean i would have learned everything by the end of week three the last three weeks are more like just hands-on experience and trying to get there. And so I thought it was really unfair that you have enough experience, you have the qualifications, you worked in the field, and then you go back as an intern for six months is again, like going back three steps in your career. Um, and it may work if you've taken a longer period, like if you've taken a two, three year gap, and I have friends who've taken two, three years uh, maternity leave, which is great, like then it's a good, option but um yeah i don't know how i would feel or i would love to hear what others think about this of going back for um six oh i see a comment already even working for such little money is not available to many women yes i completely agree but i still think we should come up with a better solution than a six month internship <laughs> yeah please hello mm -hmm. It, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't know if a, a six month internship might be the best solution, but I think the main idea behind it is that there should be mechanisms in place, guidelines and protocols so that uh, we know in academia what to do if we would want to reinsert uh, a person, in this case, a woman after a long break into the workforce again. If it is with an internship, I don't know if that's the best solution. I guess that should also be discussed on a case-to-case -case basis, it also depends on the lab or something like that. Um, but I think it's a good start to think that this doesn't exist. Like, so people don't know what to do to reinsert, um, uh, especially in this case, women who have taken maternity uh, leave or something for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I, I agree that there should be explicit solutions and like possibilities like how to reinsert people that were outside of work i also think this this solution have to be very planned very carefully and they, they, sometimes and i don't know I, I i have read about some like solutions that were okay for each kid people you get in in contracts i mean there is a maximum of time where you can get a contract that's six months like this um 
limited contracts, and for each kid you get then maybe two two more years. Sorry, this six years for for these limited contracts, and for each kid you get maybe one more year. And that's the same for men and women. And then that's contraproductive, by because of that what we were saying. I mean, maybe many men take this parental leave to be even more productive, and then they even have the same. Um, opportunity to get two more years of these kind of contracts that are supposed to be for people that are initiating their careers. So I agree that should be, yeah, this, this kind of paths, but that also have to be thought very carefully. Yeah. So now I think we are, um, there's also again, um, very interesting um, comments on the chat. Um, I think we, yeah, I, we for, for the video and on the YouTube recording, we will also include all the links that are being uh, shared on the chat. And now we are like getting to the last 15 minutes and um, the idea of the last 15 minutes is to also maybe open the discussion to other, other topics that want to be, yeah, that you want to, to discuss or to comment on. Um, I don't know if there is something we have not talked about. Uh, yeah, Kyla and Aloha. So, Kyla, so you first. Yeah, I'd like to maybe pose a very specific question. So we've talked about all these things and we talked about possible solutions. And I would be interested in knowing if anyone here has specific suggestions that they think that could be captured like within an Our Ladies Freiburg type of a format. So like topics that you think that we could go deeper into or um, any sort of suggestions that you have related to things that specifically we who are here or even just we, the co-organizers of Our Ladies Freiburg could like implement that would be interesting to you. So if you have any thoughts, I mean, chime in or you can write them in the chat and we'll be, we'll be taking notes. <laughs> Thanks, Carla. So Daloa, if you want to say something, and then if people want to also then express your comments or idea, you are welcome. Uh, yes, I just, I, I know we don't really have the time to go into this, but we haven't even talked about the, the pay gap in um, harassment for women at work, any type of harassment. So I just wanted to mention these two topics. These are also very important and this might need uh, extra sessions or a, a different, um, uh, like another environment to talk about it, but just wanted to make sure that it doesn't escape our minds that these issues also exist. Um, and the second idea that I had is that uh, Ivana mentioned uh, in the chat that we should gather all the, the restrictions and decisions that we, we were talking about in, in interviews, I think, and all of that uh, from different countries and make a comparison if it doesn't exist yet. And well, I don't know how the Our Ladies Freiburg normally work, but I don't know if this would be an idea to do um, a collaborative project between uh, um, uh, the, the, the data observatory on gender that Ivana leads and Our Ladies Freiburg. I don't know how many of the community in Freiburg might want to work on that um, and join forces to see if like this would be an interesting product to obtain out of this uh, discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Dalo. I think we are taking notes as well. Um, and I also think there are two very important topics that we haven't talked about, like uh, the gap on the payment and also harassment. So if also someone wants to discuss something about that, we still have some time. Yes, I also had a question on how to actually, we, we've been talking about discussions and um, having conversations around this topic, but how do we actually engage with people um, and have conversations? Just to give a comparison, we've run this five part series and the first four parts had over 100 RSVPs, not this one. Um, every other um, session had 50 to 60 um, participants, not this one, this we are like at a 50% lower rate. Um, 
how do we get the same attendance for these kind of events? How do we actually engage in conversation with people who are not already in this field and not already talking about this every chance they get? Yeah, please, Ivana. <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, I think uh, for the question uh, from Divya, uh, the, the thing that worked for us the most in, in Data Genero uh, is working with a group of communicators that are really able to uh, speak to the general public. Because if you say like gender data or uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, people get scared and run away. But uh, we are trying to communicate things in a like simple and easy way. And uh, we are currently uh, doing a datathon, uh, like a hackathon, but with data, missing data uh, in a lot of areas. And we have like 200 participants uh, from people that didn't know anything about data, but were like involved in our campaign. And maybe it's, uh, an effort to build a larger community of R with another communities that are working with media and journalism and uh, design and make something powerful with all those uh, languages. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's great. And there is also a, a question on the chat um, to all the panelists. It says that many of the problems discussed apply not only to science academia, but to other professions as well. And if do you think challenges in academia are on average more or less severe than in other professions? Does any have an idea? There, are also, there is also a discussion in the chat. I mean, um, Carmen says she doesn't think so. Really. Um, yeah, and I saw Lily raising hand and also unmuting. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I'm not sure if it's like if you can generalize that that academia is is really like this or like that. Uh, it probably depends very much on the country context, as, as we have heard now, uh, that the situation is really different. Uh, you know, we, we heard about uh, experiences in Brazil or in Canada or I don't know, uh, Georgia <laughs> a little bit. So, so it's really different. So, um, so from the one hand, we can learn from these uh, country differences, um, but I, but I, I guess that what what is um, it can be also transferable to other sectors. So it, it doesn't necessarily um, happen only in academia, but it's just that maybe some things are specific to to some sectors. So, so that's why you would want to uh, talk about one, one sector or another. Thanks, Lily. I saw also that Lisa answered that question saying that um, she works in local and provincial governments and it sounds like universities are less progressive and, and more difficult to navigate. Um, also like my own experience is working on government sometimes is even more difficult because there, there are less spaces, at least in my experience, less spaces to think about the things. Um, and then I saw that Loa also raising hands and then Camila. Yeah, um, uh, well, in my personal experience, because the other field I've worked on is medicine, clinical medicine, and what normally happens in medicine, well, there are other challenges. One of these things is that some specialties in medicine are mostly preferred by men and then women think that they are not a good fit there. For example, for uh, for being an orthopedician, sometimes you need a lot of strength to uh, like fix some fra bone fractures. And some women might think that they're not strong enough to do that, I think. Or could it be in surgery in general, there's uh, traditionally always have been more men than women. Could it be more that you need to spend several hours in a surgery and you don't know how long it's really gonna take. So men have more freedom to do that. Whereas women would prefer more a different type of profession, uh, like specialty in this case, um, I don't really know. Uh, from my friend's personal experience as well, I think uh, similar issues are at least with women uh, in leadership positions in the industry, several types of industry. Um, it, it's, there's a lack of recognition. Uh, there's some sort of um, 
personal doubts from this, this woman in, in leadership or women in leadership in general, and also this, the way that other coworkers see uh, this woman in leadership. Sometimes they're not, they're kind of skeptical, at least in the beginning, until the woman finally proves that she is qualified for the position. And this doesn't traditionally happen with men in, in, in a similar uh, position of management. But apart from that, I really have no experience and I would really appreciate it from all these comments in the chat and in the panel to see what others have been going through. Thanks, Dalo. And now I see Camila also raising hands. Mm. Yeah, um, I want to just uh, request about uh, a question. Let's say if there is, uh, if it's the, the same problems in other um, professions, I can say you that in my little experience in um, as an engineer in uh, a national company, I didn't have any problem with the uh, males or with the um, so I'm I'm. I can say you that there isn't a problem. <laughs> there is some, some difficulties, but not problems or something. And about the question that we tell if um, after vaccinated and if after um, the pandemic, the, the pandemic period, if that we will uh, do our meetups in um, online or uh, in present, I think that we will do the same for uh, uh, ladies Algiers because um, the pandemic has given us the, the chance to be here now and to discuss about uh, many things. And it was we had this chance to to uh, to do a meeting that um, that joined by part, we had participated from all of the world. So I think that we will keep in, uh, in this and we will do uh, our meetups uh, online. Thank you, Eliza. Yeah, um, thank you, um, uh, Camila. And now I see, uh, we are, I mean, we are kind of getting to the, like uh, getting to the end. So I see Lisa has raised hands, yeah. Do I'll just I just wanted to add one comment because I thought it was really interesting how um, Deloa had made a comment about the the field of medicine and then Camilla had commented in terms of the engineering that I I absolutely do think that the field and the area of 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 work or study or or whatever area that you are in makes a massive massive difference in terms of of the inclusion. Um, and the willingness of people to be inclusive in those areas. Um, so the example you gave in terms of, of not, perhaps there's this idea that the woman isn't strong enough or that there's a barrier there. Um, so I work in local government and this is what uh, firefighting. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, I'm really sorry. I wanted to lower your hand and I muted you, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying that it, that um, the industry is a big one that we run into in local government in terms of firefighting um, or engineering is a huge one in terms of, of not being part of the old boys club or any of these things at the same time that there's other areas where it is um, the HR department is 90% women. And so the one of the positive things that comes out of that is that the policies coming out of that become highly inclusive. Now, whether those actually get applied as they're supposed to is a different question, but the thought behind it tends to be. Um, and I know my sister who works in academia tends to run up against much more barriers in terms of getting things addressed and getting things changed just because everything is so dispersed between departments and um, labs that work specifically in a different way than other ones. Um, and the less cohesive the organization are, the, the harder it seems to be to get some of those changes, changes worked through. Um, and then I just wanted to end by saying this has been a fabulous discussion and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the, the thoughts and perspectives from, from everybody in here. It's just been wonderful. Yeah, I also want to thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you all. 
for participating, for being here. I mean, it was really a great discussion, especially the panelists that, that were also willing to be here, discuss and share ideas, um, information with us. So, yeah, I mean, we are already getting to the end. I think the discussion could be really long, uh, much longer than this, but I guess we have all at least and new ideas to think about and to discuss about and new possibilities that will allow us to yeah, make, make changes on these topics. And yeah, I also want to thank you all very much uh, for your participation and, and comments and questions. Um, yeah. And again, a special thanks again to, to the panelists. So Lily, Mansi, Daloa, Camila, uh, and Ivana. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Thank you so much. And well, I'm, yeah, bye bye to everyone. And well, it was, a, I think, a very nice way of finishing this series that were, yeah, really great. So thank you again. And I hope to see you next time here or in other <laughs> spaces. Thanks. Thanks for organizing and thanks for for inviting us. I also very much appreciated the discussion and yeah, hope to. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, for the future future collaborative projects or something. Good. Gracias, Eli. <laughs> Gracias. Nos vemos. Nos vemos y hablamos. Bye, everyone.